the example of that is to see that you can help in future decision making and it provides to give you a characteristic policy of current and past contracts and it supports better communication making expectations much more clear. The problem with forecast is that it lacks detail and uh, depending on the performance measurement system it, it drives the wrong performance measurement that means the basis of the forecast will be you know it, it will detail the wrong performance measurement system and so a lot of this is behavioral driven so performance measurement systems are behavioral driven which is accomplished with it. So if you have a wrong data, then the performance or the managers tend to look at the wrong data and look at historical, yeah. But feeling or reason instead of the actual feeling. So the, the syndrome is garbage in, garbage out. If you, are, you don't have a very good data, then you don't have a very good system. So I want to pro promote a very important concept on measurement. When you don't know anything about a measurement scheme, for example, you know, are you I ISO 14,000 certified or not, you start out with being dichotomous, yes or no. Then when you get to more details about the measurement system, you are able to get a Likert scheme, like 1 to 5, 1 to 7, saying how well you have done on this particular scheme. Okay? The, the most objective scheme of measurement is objective data. When you have a continuous scale and uh, objective versus uh, subjective scheme. So, the higher order is objective in terms of yes and no, but the most sophisticated scheme is based on objective, saying if you can identify what your measurement of your scheme is. This is the problem that <coughs> when you want to ask the supplier, they'll give you and then you don't know what to do with it, okay? You don't know what to do with it because you got stream and stream of data from the same uh, data and you don't know what to do with it. One way to do this is to look at data given by suppliers from a viewpoint of curiosity. So let me give you some examples. Here's the case study, okay? One is to understand the interdependency in data. Then identify the root cause of this particular data and develop the action of prioritizing the plan. So what it does is it's important to understand the interrelationship between data in the metrics in the portfolio. Then you look at the patterns in the portfolio and then you look at natural themes. So in supply chain, it's very, very important to look at the natural themes. The natural themes is, I have a focal company right here, okay, in the internal metric. So I'm looking at the internal metric, and then I'm looking at the supplier facing metrics and customer facing metrics, okay. So if I look at internal facing at things like inventory. I am looking at things like production schedule variance. So all of these things are involved in the company itself. Okay? What is happening in transportation cost? What is happening to cycle time? What is happening to warehousing cost? Okay? But now I am also looking at supplier facing metrics. So the supplier facing metrics is supplier on time quality. What is the supplier raw material inventory? Uh, how how long is it? 
pistonium, dase cable pistonium, and inbound transfer. Same thing in the outbound side. Order to delivery uh, D time, uh, perfect order, forecast accuracy, delay change, uh, uh, outstanding and so on. So we have metrics relating to the internal metrics, uh, relating to the supply metrics, and relating to the customer metrics. Okay. So we have a very good way of supply chain team by looking at what is happening in the company box, what's happening in the supplier box, and what's happening in the customer box. So this is a very important. So when you look at a a depiction of the data from a company point of view, there are two things that can go wrong. Okay? One is how it can go wrong with respect to the company and supplier and how it can go wrong with the customer. So look at this. Okay? If you look at a hierarchy of supplier metrics, when we look at two things which can go wrong, one is the demand side and one is the supply side. Okay? So we are looking at metrics which look at above par, you know, on par and below par. First thing is on the demand side. So if you look at this company which is looking at demand side, you find that okay, it's fine with demand forecast, uh, not so good with, uh, uh, on the uh, on perfect order and the supply side. Okay, what we're saying is we have a problem with respect to supply, but not a problem with respect to with, with the demand. So this tells you that so what this tells you is when you share it tells you that practical company in terms of how we want to deliver the scorecard. So, what are the characteristics of a scorecard? First thing is, the scorecard should be flexible. Okay? A good scorecard is one which is flexible. Okay? It should incorporate the internal voice of the customers. It should be proactive. In terms of giving on honor war, very early warning. It should so I can take my scorecard and be able to benchmark against. It should be user friendly. Okay. So, the and acknowledged by the top management system separates the critical view against the marginal value. Okay. I want to give you an example of a actual scorecard which we did with the company. Okay, a company called Rockwell. And what we did is that we looked at typical scorecard criteria. And most of the time, <coughs> it was not based on cost. It was based on everything other than cost. So, they looked at delivery quality, customer service, ratio data, cost, cost save, capability and so on. And when you look at the object criteria, looking at things like quality, delivery, inventory management and total cost of ownership and all that. But the subjective criteria was exchange of data. <coughs> How well is the willing to deliver exchange of data in terms of things support, system support and relationship support. Okay. So this this gives you an idea of what the scorecard is. If you look at it, you know, all of this validated, 
25 percent for quality, 25 percent for Dell, 25 percent for inventory, and 25 percent for TCO. But look, okay. So if you look at quality, very traditional things like process capability, uh, ISO certification, uh, lot, lot uh, rejects, which you see is actual lot of percentage. Doctor stock percentage, which is how much of the percentage numbers are doctor stock. So we have the measurement of all of these individual items. Okay, okay. Dell will be the same thing. What is the cycle time? What is the lead time? And uh, when you took a let, uh, take a look at the inventory management, they are looking at lots of things like. You have supply integration participant, weeks of inventory, which is very common, and system side. That means whether you have a Kanban type of a system, that you have visuality into the Kanban part of a system, whether you have visual from the company to the uh, supplier in terms of uh, visuality. And TCO is very interesting. Did you do the TCO breakdown? You know, and uh, have you identified the calm down in terms of TCO? How can I interp interpret the individual determination of uh, TCO calm down? And did I implement this? You know, so it's very detailed in terms of TCO down down. You know, did I intervene in? Did I uh, you know, in, did I get a call, contribution or in terms of the TCO down down and did I implement this? So it's fairly detailed in that. Now, on the qualitative side, yes. So, what is TCO? So, what is TCO? Excuse me? So, what is TCO? I didn't hear. TCO is total cost of ownership. Total cost of ownership. So, have you detailed the total cost of ownership in terms of the details, in terms of how you can improve the cost, the cost breaking? Okay. You want? We are not at just qualitative part of it, but we are looking at how the exchange of information is taking place. You know. Did we get external from Dun and Bradstreet? Getting information from the company you know, in terms of PCO breakdown. Are we getting engineering support? Are we getting system support? Are we getting relationship support in terms of this individual P2, P2P in terms of purchase orders? Or are we getting evergreen contracts? Or are we getting contracts which are long term and so on. So, the contractive support and the qualitative support is then built out in terms of the whole, the whole school score, score is part, okay. So, we get feedback, we get collaborative support and we get issue resolution and then we try to understand what is the real time support from the customer and keep revising and updating. So, the point we are trying to make is that we get qualitative support and quantitative support from the supplier to constantly feed the support card, okay, quantitative and qualitative, okay. Now, we need to, we need to another concept called the balance scorecard. So, the balance scorecard is much more sophisticated than the current so, uh, scorecard. How? So, in the balance scorecard what we look at is not just the financial support, it looks at four perspectives. Okay? The first one is financial perspective, which we already know. And then we look at customer perspective. 
how are we viewing ourselves with the customer. Then we look at process perspective, which we all know, you know, in terms of how is our company in terms of processes dealing with the company, dealing with the company. And finally, we look at learning and growth perspective. So that says how are we growing as a company, how are we growing as a as a company. So these four perspectives collectively belongs in the balance scorecard. They are saying that financial alone is not important. We have to look at the customer perspective, we have to look at process perspective, we have to look at the learning and growth perspective. So let me give you some examples. Okay? So when you look at financial perspective, which we know a lot about, we are looking at things like return on capital. Okay? We are looking at things like cash flow. We are looking at things like sales backlog and all that, right? So what we do not know is the customer perspective. Customer perspective means that how are we viewed with respect to the customer in terms of satisfaction? How are we viewed with respect to the customer in terms of key account management and so on? Okay. The same thing from a process perspective. What is the rework? What is the perspective in terms of safety? What's the perspective in terms of project, you know, environment, uh, project performance? And finally, what we don't measure a lot is the last box, which is the innovation and learning perspective. Like, how are we in, you know, waiting in terms of our company? How are we, what's the percentage of revenue coming from new services? What is the staff attitude? So, companies tend to evaluate each other in saying, how do you like working in this company? Like, think about eBay's and all that, right? They want to know this perspective, saying, you know, how do you like belonging with this particular perspective? And that's what it's tracking, you know, percentage of employee suggestions. How many of the employees give suggestions to improve the operations of the particular employee, right? So, if you if you resonate with a particular company and you really like being part of the company, you are going to give a lot of suggestions and employee suggestions in terms of how to improve the company. So, that's what we are capturing over here, the staff attitude survey. Many companies don't even bother to to capture this. So, you are saying, if you are in the company, you enjoy working in the company, you want to know how well you are just a resonation of working with the company. And that's what this is capturing, the innovation learning. I want to grow with this particular company. I want the company to grow as well with this particular company. So, that's what we are capturing in terms of the balance focus. Okay? So, now, once you understand the balance scorecard, it becomes very tricky to understand the X balance scorecard. X balance scorecard stands for cross enterprise balance scorecard. Very few companies are doing. So, what you are trying to do is to measure your balance scorecard with a supplier balance scorecard. Okay? So, what we are trying to do is to understand that from a BSC balance scorecard, how do I go to XBSC? XBSC is the cross enterprise balance scorecard. So, what we are trying to do is primarily to build linkages, to build linkages between your supplier company and your your company in terms of the balance scorecard. And I can explain this very critically through one slide. Okay? So, you have as a buyer, you have a balance profile. Okay? What is it comprised of? How do I work with my company, with my supplier? How do I work with R&D, purchasing, production and logistics balance profile? Okay? So, here I am dealing with my internal balance profile. So, what is my production? Uh, R&D balance scorecard is finished goods. What is my purchasing balance scorecard? It's largely with 
finished goods and modules. Okay, what's my production and logistics uh, plan so far? It's with all the greater modules that I supply uh, or I uh, deliver from my balance sheet card. Now, for the supplier point of view, they have their balance sheet card on their own, and they are looking at internal balance sheet card. So they are looking at modules. They are looking at supply chain. They are looking at so the R and D, B and C in this particular box is what they supply to you in terms of the balance sheet card. Okay, the sales B and C is what they supply to you in terms of the balance sheet card. The production and logistics balance uh, balance sheet card is what they do in terms of internal balance sheet card modules components. Okay. For you, it's not the component; it's the finished goods. So there is an integration going on between the supplier and you, and that's what is there in the back box, uh, the black box over here. So you have a supplier relationship strategy which integrates the modules that you supply from the supplier to the company. Do you follow? Do you follow what's going on? All right. So, this is a high level of integration of balance sheet card, where you are looking at an integration from a finished good point of view, but you are integrating it from the supplier point. Is it clear? Okay. So, when I did research on the balance sheet card. From a lot of companies in India, I found that most of them tend to be very static. That means they are not built from historical information. Okay, and they are also batched from legacy system in the sense that most of the time they are very not they are not dynamic. Based on legacy system and Summarize periodically. Okay, the problem with this uh, balance sheet card is that they tend to be very bias centric. I design a uh, balance sheet card for a customer. Okay, and that's what it is. I'm not looking at the customer viewpoint at all. Okay, and they tend to be reliant on some specific functional device. So sometimes, sometimes in finance, sometimes in accounting, and so on. And the problem is that there were a lot of manual interventions and overrides into the balance sheet card. But the true need for this balance sheet card is to tie the score card to the strategic goals of the company and the division or the firm. You need to have. An end-to-end -end divis uh, divisibility of the uh, balance sheet card. So, what we tend to find is that what is important gets attained, attention, okay, from the supplier, CEO, and so on. So, once we get the attention of the CEO, they get a lot of attention and get a quicker response in terms of the balance sheet. So we have a system of carrots and principles. That means that you you reward bad behavior, and you also reward good. 
good behavior. So, when we try to look at the bad behavior, that is, we try to look at the characteristics of the poor part, which is punitive in nature. That means, if you do not do very well, then we try to restrict bidding, we try to reward your, uh, your supplier and maybe even reward your supplier. And from the rewarding, the, the carriage possible, we try to look at looking at giving better credit terms, giving better you know uh, volumes of business for the supplier who is doing very very good, who is very good. But the scorecard has to kind of evolve into a very good supplier development initiative that you work with the supplier to make sure that you know that they are working very well. So, the assignment I have for you is to look, look at the lead certification, which I will bring up in a minute and try to look at an actual company to be able to devolve not only the green part of it, but the CSR part of it. So, I want you to get into your teams right now okay, and look at these ideals of a scorecard development in terms of what you need to do in terms of the development of a scorecard and to develop this and then we will hope to get two or three uh, presentations from this. Is it clear? Is it clear? Okay. So, I want you to get into your team. You got the document about the lead certification, right? So, you take the lead certification and look at it from a company's point of view and say that, okay, I am going to devolve a scorecard, environmental scorecard for a company that we know you know that uh, we, we are a hypothetical company to develop this company's scorecard from the viewpoint of the IT. Is it clear? Is it clear? Okay. So, you have the scorecard, right? You have the lead scorecard. So, I want you to work with this and to develop with the uh, ideal scorecard and then I want you to present it to the rest of, rest of the class. Okay. So, start from there. energy, safety and what not and how you are going to be able to <coughs> decide the weight attached to these uh, environmental tools. Okay? So, you will talk also about the implementation of these tools that when you are working with the company and you are saying I have designed this scorecard, how is it supposed to work? Okay? So, <coughs> the end goal is to have maybe one or two of your teams to come and present to say that, okay, this is the tool we develop in terms of environmental scorecard. This is how we justify the environmental metrics along with the weights attached to that, you know, and uh, this is how we are going to use it in our particular company, okay. So, do you have any questions? Is it clear what the assignment is? is somewhat accessible to some from the from a project high right, means if the credit is given a score then we, how much value I, we need to give and then we'll we'll evaluate across the companies we'll have maybe two or three percent how do I uh, environmental quality tool is it clear okay all right so let's get down to business and uh, developing that and then I am going to have two or three teams come and present. Okay? All right. Start discussing. And look at the lead certification tools and also the environmental Walmart tools and to adopt this particular tool. What is the best in class in terms of that? Okay? All right. Establishing a cold storage unit in a rural areas uh, by running uh, agro waste as a fuel in, uh, for gas in the gasifier. So uh, 
we have considered this project name based on the situation happening uh, regularly in the area of Nelakotai, which is near to our location. There, uh, a special uh, special GI based uh, jasmine is available over there, and uh, a huge market is available. But uh, in some particular seasons, uh, the jasmine rate for one kg become less than 50 rupees, and uh, in some time during the marriage seasons, it the rate goes beyond 1,500 rupees per kg. So, like that. Uh, in order to uh, uh, give one solution, proper solution for those uh, agriculture, agri people, uh, we got this idea. So, based on that situation and uh, the plant location and establishment, we have filled these uh, credits over here. So, first, uh, we have sensitive land protection. Whether uh, the land needs to be that much secure as yes, because uh, it, it does not need to have any disturbances from the surrounding area. High priority said yes, because uh, it needs to be accessible for all the landowners so in order to give their uh, jasmine to the site. And uh, surrounding density and diverse uses. So here uh, the surrounding density we we are uh, in which point we give the uh, we don't have we don't have any idea about this. So we give five as a question mark because that location can be a uh, uh, near to a public area means uh, the population area or else. With the diverse users may be a uh, high, uh, may be having a good storage for else or else we are promoting that uh, land as a when good hub area to store that with a good security like that. So we don't know whether it is high, having high secure or not like that. And uh, access to quality transit, yes. A bicycle facility, yes. Because the landowners will give their product via cycle only. They don't have any cars or tractors to deliver it because maximum from one particular area they can give in a bunch of, uh, in, a, in a single bag, they will deliver it. Reduced parking footprint, yes, of course. And green vehicles, yes, cycle is a green vehicle. And sustainable site, site assessment, as I already discussed, it is the accessible one. Site development, protect and resource habitat. Uh, it will be protect, but uh, the resource habitat is, uh, Either it is not possible because uh, the site is running with uh, gasifier, so many ash will be formed. So uh, it is very difficult to restore it to again a cultivator area, like something like that. And open space, yes, it is having open space because we need to keep a more amount of raw materials to run the gasifier. And uh, rainwater management, yes, of course, because we need to uh, have a cooling tower as well as. Uh, uh, to remove the dust and all, and we need to clean the proper, uh, clean the indoor unit of the storage area as well as to clean the gasifier unit also. We need to have water. So better if we have the rainwater management means it will be useful for us. So uh, the shed which is covered the gasifier area will be uh, having a rainwater harvesting unit and which can be used. And uh, heat island reduction, uh, that we don't know. Light pollution reduction, there is no light uh, Production is of course yes. Water efficiency, outdoor water use reduction. We don't have any outdoor water use reduction. We maximum we will try to reduce uh, use it through the rainwater itself. And indoor water use reduction, we will use it only for uh, cleaning the cold storage unit. And the cooling tower water use, yes, we are having water metering, yes, we need to have. Energy and uh, enhanced commissioning means uh, it is having a high facility and uh, having a high power because if we installed this site, this plant in the particular site, uh, we will try to reach it in the all the surrounding cities of, around the Nelakota area. So um, all the people will try to keep uh, surrender their uh, jasmine flowers to us in order to. Uh, gain a good margin in the seasonal time. So, we, uh, the plant will play a major role in their economy. Uh, optimize energy. We are running <coughs> optimize energy performance, yes, of course, because we are running through gasifier, we are using only agro waste as a, uh, which is a renewable energy source and uh, the, uh, we are running the uh, refrigeration unit which is also a clean one, we are not going to use an uh, 
uh, sealed uh, greenhouse gas uh, refrigerant like that. Advanced energy meeting, we don't want like that. We, uh, we are not handling with the power area. Demand response, that is uh, based on their uh, landowners request only. So we don't bother about the demand and all. Our plant mot mm, motive is that to run the plant based on the request from the farmers. And uh, we are not running for pa profit uh, purpose. We just want to have a good uh, life, uh, good lifestyle for the farmers area. So maybe it can be operative plant like that. Renewable energy production, yes, of course. En enhanced refrigerant, man refrigerant management, yes, of course. Green power and carbon. storage and the collection of recycle uh, in this material and resources uh, the water the materials we are having means only the raw materials from the farm uh, means the agro waste from the field as well as jasmine flower so here uh, based on that material and resources what are the parameters here considered as building life cycle impact reduction whether that building uh, will get uh, reduct, uh, its life cycle uh, will get reduced or not like that mostly we will use Mm, one shed which is covered for the uh, gasifier unit and uh, uh, engine run, engine and another one is coal storage unit maximum it will be covered like a thermocol uh, thermocol shed like that so mostly there will be not much that much reduction and all and the building pro environmental product declaration yes of course there, there is no pollution occurring to the environmental area through this and uh, sourcing of raw materials we are having it regularly Material ingredients, yes, and the construction and demolition of waste management, yes, we are doing it. Indoor environmental quality, enhanced indoor air quality strategies, we don't want to maintain it uh, because uh, the output is mostly uh, just a gas format only, not uh, uh, dust particles like that. Low emitting materials, yes, and the con con construction of indoor air quality management plan, no. Indoor air quality assessment, we don't need to have. Thermal comfort, yes, stabilized uh, air cooling will be there. Interior lighting, we don't want to have. Uh, daylight, we don't have. Uh, quality views, we will just check the quality of the plant running, whether it is properly working or not, having good temperatures or not. Acoustic performance, yes, because gasifier is running as well as the engine is running, so we will have some sound. Innovation, it is purely an innovative one for the rural areas and the agri professional we need to have. And this regional priority, we don't have any idea about how to uh, maintain. Uh, this plant needs to have a good uh, tie-up with the surrounding areas. So any person who needs to get benefit through this plant can have a contact with the, with, uh, the plant operative person and can get benefit. That's it. So our total points get 66.